Okay, so <clears throat> we're continuing with, with uh, Lecture 6. This is uh, Microbiology Lecture 6, Part 2. And we're going to talk about culture medium. Um, the culture medium is what, the, what microorganisms are grown on. Um, it's always prepared, uh, sterile, and uh, ready for use uh, in a as a sterile uh, medium for uh, bacterial or microorganism growth, because you don't want to confuse uh, contaminants that were present in it before it was sterilized. Uh, if there were any that were there and it wasn't sterilized, it would grow those. Uh, you don't want to confuse it with anything that came from the environment, only from the inoculum. That's all you're interested in, what was in the inoculum, the original inoculum. So it's always prepared sterile. The inoculum are the microorganisms that are introduced into the medium for growth to see if they grow. And it's a method that's used to uh, increase the numbers, uh, try and purify it to the one of interest, uh, look at the one of interest and often identify the one of interest or identify characteristics of that organism. <clears throat> culture refers to growing them, allowing them to multiply uh, in the culture medium. And typically, you know, there's all kinds of culture media prepared in all different kinds of ways uh, that are then in a sterile manner that are then uh, inoculated with a sample and they are cultured. So the culture grows, uh, typically, uh, not always, but quite often it's by putting it into an incubator at 37 degrees in a humidified environment <clears throat> and allowing it to grow overnight, minimum overnight. Some organisms take longer, some use uh, uh, more uh, specialized uh, conditions like uh, anaerobic chambers or uh, higher CO2 or uh, different temperatures. But uh, typically we have incubators that are, you know, uh, 37 degrees humidified atmospheric air and that's what we use usually, not always. <clears throat> now the typical um, agent that the medium is prepared in is of course water, but with uh, agar added. Agar is a, complex polysaccharide that almost all microorganisms cannot break down. There's few, certainly few in our environment or from that grow in humans or on humans or in the atmosphere that will break it down. And so it's quite useful because it acts as a uh, gel. It, uh, it, uh, causes the formation of a gel. It will uh, solidify into a gelatin at uh, approximately 40 degrees centigrade. So at room temperature, which is 22, of course, 22 centigrade, then it is uh, solid. It's hard to call it solid. It's semi-solid like a gelatin. Uh, the f water in gelatin is readily available to anything that's growing on in it or on its surface. Uh, it's also useful because it's uh, not only a solidifying agent for culture medium, well, all sorts of things that microorganisms need can be added to it and will um, will solidify as the as the agar gels into a solid gel. <clears throat> it's no different than adding uh, you know uh, orange juice to jello and letting, while it's hot and letting, stirring it up and then letting it solidify. So we can add all kinds of nutrients or additional uh, agents, chemical agents that uh, allow us to do that. We can, sometimes we add blood cells for, to make uh, blood agar, you know, and it can be prepared in Petri dishes or as a slant or uh, a stab culture, also called deep. Um, the fact that it liquefies at 100 degrees is quite useful because that means that uh, you can prepare it and 100 degrees centigrade is boiling. So if it's in a water, uh, 
<coughs> uh, solvent, which it is, prepared in water, then it'll boil and you can boil it for a while and sterilize it in that way and pour it into, you know, closed Petri plates or Petri dishes or into a tube that will be closed so it'll stay sterile. And the fact that agar by itself cannot be metabolized by broken down and used as a nutrient by most microbes means that um, <clears throat> um, whatever is added, they are using that uh, to grow on. Whatever you add to the agar, that's what the uh, organisms are using. So you can know exactly whether what their needs are or whether they can or cannot grow in the presence of a particular thing. It's not the agar that's allowing them to grow no matter what. Okay, so culture media, and there are many, many, many kinds of culture media. Bacterial culture was uh, developed in the 1800s, <clears throat> second half of the uh, 19th century, uh, where it was first rec when it was first recognized that uh, microorganisms exist all around us in our environment, and they are the cause of um, uh, food spoilage and uh, disease, many diseases, um, and that they're ubiquitously present everywhere. People not only worked on that, but they also worked on developing methods to grow them. And many of these have um, stuck and were are extremely efficient and useful. Uh, the media itself uh, can be chemically defined. Uh, in which case the exact chemical composition is known. Uh, so the components in it are known and the amounts of it uh, or concentrations are known. <clears throat> or they could be complex uh, media that are used. You know, you take, the, uh, you take a liquid solution for chemically defined and you, you take water and you add particular chemicals and then you boil it. Uh, you add agar and, to the water and then you add chemical compounds and you boil it and then you can pour it into plates, or if you don't add agar, you could uh, prepare it, you boil it with the chemical compounds and it would be like a broth. Uh, not, nah, it's not good to call it a broth, a solution, chemically defined media uh, in solution. So it could be with or without agar. Complex media, it's not exactly known what the exact composition is because these are extracts or digests. Sometimes it's, uh, uh, you know, they take some meat and uh, boil it uh, for a while to break down the components, the proteins into amino acids. Uh, you know, fats get broken down into individual lipid, different lipids. Uh, carbohydrates get broken down, and are, so you get essentially the same idea as soup. <clears throat> Uh, and, you know, you can buy these uh, as powdered uh, preparations to, to, to make complex media. So you can get beef heart extract or uh, meat extract, uh, beef extract, etc. You know, different kinds of, or even plant extracts, peptone extract. Sometimes they take uh, something that was alive, yeast or meat or plant, and uh, digest it using an enzyme. So it's broken down into its components and then they take the lick and warmed in water and they collect the water, get rid of the solids and they use, then they, uh, uh, they let it dry till they get a powder and that's what they use for the complex media. They sell powder and then in the, whoever buys it in the lab, they prepare it in water with or without agar. If it's without agar, it would be a, nutrient broth and if it's with agar it would be a nutrient agar uh, if you're just using some kind of digest of yeast or meat or plants so we, we can have complex media we can have chemically defined media we can have it with agar without agar etc and here you see some examples of complex versus uh, uh, chemically defined so on the uh, on the right side, we have uh, complex media, example of complex media on the left, a uh, chemically defined medium. In the complex media, they have added some beef. Uh, when they say beef extract, that's simply a boiled preparation of uh, beef that they, they get from, uh, you know, things that are not used typically for uh, consumption. There's a lot of extra leftover material, so they 
buy it, they uh, and they'll uh, boil it up. <clears throat> Peptone is uh, partially, it's an enzyme digest of proteins, so it's uh, small proteins. They have five grams of that, three grams of that, some salt. They add agar, so this is going to be a gelatin kind of uh, 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 preparation. And wa if you add water and boil it, then you got a liquid that you can pour into a petri dish and then cover with a cover, and then you'll have you know, agar, I'm going to make it green, agar solidified is a gelatin inside a petri dish. Or you could pour it into a tube and you would have, you know, again, uh, the agar solidifies. But this is nutrient agar, it contains nutrients. If it was just agar, nothing would grow because most microorganisms cannot break down and use the polysaccharides in agar as a uh, as nutrients. A slant culture would look like this where the, you pour it into the tube and then you put the tube on a slant and so while the agar is still, remember that it's going in hot after being sterilized, warmed, boiled, so it goes in hot and because it's at a slant you'll get that kind of a could have put more of a slant on the, on this culture, you know. Quite often we we prepare them like that, so you have a nice uh, long surface that solidifies inside, just giving more surface area for growth. Whoops, I went outside the tube, didn't I? It's, I'm not that great an artist with this icon, but there you go. That's a slant. Uh, here is a slant, here's a petri dish, here's a uh, deep or, or stab type of culture. Uh, but the same thing can also be made typically, and on this side they're not using agar, but uh, just solution. Uh, there's no agar added. Uh, but all the components are defined, so the exact chemical components are known, and the quantities are known in the preparation of a chemically defined medium boil it up and put it into a tube okay now i did tell you that normally we just use a uh, you know a incubator that's using atmospheric air and uh, 37 degrees and mm, there's would be a dish in the bottom for water so it's humidified but certain bacteria have uh, specialized requirements uh, example of that would be aerobic uh, obligate anaerobes so uh, we do also anaerobic culture in which all the uh, oxygen is removed. Typically the medium is a reducing kind of medium because that will also help uh, reduce the amount of oxygen available. Uh, reduce, reduction is, a, is a, a gain of electrons, so it ties up any free oxygen. It can also contain other molecules that uh, are able to uh, combine with oxygen. They use heat in the preparation of the chamber to drive off any present oxygen. This is particularly important to test uh, samples. If uh, anaerobic uh, organisms are suspected to be in the sample in the, from the patient, uh, there are four important uh, species members of the genus Clostridium, which cause disease in humans. And you should know the name of the organism and the name of the disease that they cause. And I'll just uh, list them off, but I've written them out for you before. Clostridium botulinum uh, is the organism. It causes botulism, a type of food poisoning. That's the disease, botulism. Mm, Clostridium perfrigens uh, is uh, the cause of uh, gas gangrene. Clostridium tetanus is the cause of the disease tetanus, and Clostridium difficile is the cause of uh, colitis, uh, diarrhea and colitis. Okay, so that's uh, anaerobic culture, and you know it can be done in a chamber. I've done this kind of culture in a chamber. It's once you get used to working with it, it's fairly straightforward. It's easy. You have these little pouches that you uh, 
cut open, add a little bit of water, and it starts giving off a lot of, just before you close the chamber, it gives off CO2 uh, and uh, hydrogen uh, gas, and that helps uh, drive off uh, uh, or helps reduce the percent oxygen in the air relative to uh, the other uh, gases. There's also a, a indicator uh, that you put in that uh, if it changes color, then you know you, you know, under anaerobic conditions, um, it's airtight. You also have uh, palladium catalyst pellets that up here that uh, take up oxygen. So the chamber is anaerobic, and if something grows, then you know you're growing an anaerobe. Okay. Uh, there are some simpler types of chamber. This one is a plastic one. She's behind the plastic. The whole thing is sealed. There are gloves built into these arms, and uh, the gloves are built into the sleeve plastic front to this cabinet that's airtight. And she just comes along and puts her hands into it, and then all the equipment she needs uh, is ins already inside the uh, chamber. This, I suppose, you know, under very primitive conditions, simple conditions, you could use it, but it's it, not done anymore. Although I, I'll admit that, <clears throat> uh, no, it's, <laughs> you know, no, it's just not done. Uh, uh, this is a term for organisms that require a higher CO2 environment. Typically what you do for that is you can do it in a little pouch like this where you have the, your plate uh, that's been inoculated. Uh, you slip it in and you <coughs> um, add some water into this uh, tube that contains chemicals that start to give off CO2. But a better way would be using an anaerobic chamber uh, that has a higher CO2 content because you've put in a pouch added water, open the pouch and added water to the pouch so it gives off CO2, more CO2. Uh, and you don't drive off the oxygen, you let the oxygen stay in the chamber. There are uh, some uh, organisms that uh, can be identified by their ability to grow in, partic in particular media and selective media are the ones that will suppress unwanted uh, organisms, the ones you're not interested in growing and encourage the growth of others. So uh, selective medium uh, is like a positive selection. You're, I'm sorry, selective medium is a, um, uh, a negative selection where you're getting rid of the ones you're not interested in and uh, allowing the growth of the ones you are interested in. An example of that in this case here, shown here is this name. I wouldn't worry about learning the Sabros dextrose agar, but it has a lower pH. Uh, you know, most organisms are grown between 6.5 and 7.5, but this one, in this uh, agar, Sabros agar, you have 5.6 uh, pH, and that encourages the growth of uh, fungi mostly. Fungi uh, grow better in acidic conditions. Another example of a selective medium would be uh, EMB, which is uh, type of medium that uh, uh, suppresses the growth of gram-positive organisms and allows for the growth of gram-negative. Okay, so it's used for culturing, growing gram, this is shorthand, gram-negative organisms. Okay, and that's a capital G minus V little small e. Okay gram negative, but it does not allow gram positives to grow. That's another example. Differential media allows us, it, it's not going to exclude anything. So it's not a negative selection where you're, you know, getting rid of everything and what you remain with is what you're interested in. It's not a selective type or negatively selective type of uh, uh, media. It allows the growth of different organisms, but it helps identify different organisms because it, it, it gives a different result that can be easily observed with uh, different uh, types of uh, 
uh, or species of organisms, bacterial organisms growing on it. This is an example. This is a photograph of a blood agar plate. The color is obviously the color of blood. There are actually red blood cells added to the um, uh, agar solution. What you do is you prepare agar and water and you boil it. To you have to make it uh, sterile and you don't add the blood. Uh, typically it's done with sheep red blood cells. You don't add, you don't add the blood until uh, when the solution's at 100 degrees boiling because that would lyse the cells, but you let it cool down till about maybe, uh, you know, mid 40s, 45 degrees centigrade. And then you add the red cells and stir, and then you quickly pour it before it drops below 40 degrees centigrade. That's the temperature that agar solidifies at. And here you see the kind of results you can see on this example of a differential medium. The example again is blood agar. This is a blood agar a petri dish with blood agar in it. There are three types of results, alpha hemolysis, beta hemolysis, and gamma hemolysis. And these are actual colonies that were uh, inoculated in the shape of the letters that define them. And they show the different types of uh, hemolysis. Alpha hemolysis shown here is partial hemolysis. What happens is that the bacteria growing on the surface, and you can see the confluent colonies. Confluent means they've all grown, they're touching each other, they've grown together. You can see all the confluent colonies growing in the shape of an alpha. That's It was inoculated it's in the shape of the letter alpha. And underneath, it's green. And that's because the uh, hemoglobin in the red cells, the red cells have lysed and the hemoglobin has, or partially lysed, and the hemoglobin has um, partly broken down and is green in color. Okay, so it's partial hemolysis and the hemoglobin has changed in color to green. Hemoglobin does change colors and you know that from your own personal experience with a bruise. A bruise, after all, is the result of bleeding under the skin, a subcutaneous bleed that can be seen at the surface as a bruise. And at first it's a purple color because the blood is dark. It's not well oxygenated, so it's dark. And then with time, it turns uh, green, brown, uh, yellow with time. So that's uh, uh, the same idea here. You have a green color in the agar in the blood cells just below. Beta hemolysis is complete hemolysis. It's, it looks yellow here in this example. It's not, that's the color of the agar. It's clear if they, if they put something underneath, you would be able to see it. It's completely clear under the uh, uh, bacterial colonies that are growing in the shape of a beta. And gamma hemolysis, this is the Greek letter gamma, okay? Alpha, beta, gamma, for those of you who never learned uh, Greek letters, alpha, beta, gamma. Uh, gamma, in this case, you have no effect of the organisms on the red cells, so there's no lysis. It looks just like blood still underneath. And these plates, typically, you read them from below. You hold the plate up to the light, and you look from below, and you'll see the change or no change or partial change in the red cells. So that's a differential medium that helps you to differentiate between different types. It's an example of a differential medium. Now you should uh, realize that it's also possible to have uh, media that are both selective and differential. And uh, an example of that is shown uh, up here. I would uh, ignore this bottom one for now. It's not a good or clear example of selective uh, and differential. So up here, what you have is uh, an EMB agar plate. It is selective, as I told you before, in terms of the ability to allow gram-negative organisms to grow, but not gram-positives. So if you do get bacterial growth on the agar plate, as you can see here, there are colonies. You can see the streaking pattern. This was plated using the streak plate method. Um, you can see the streaking method, uh, the, the streaking pattern, and also individual colonies more to the uh, left-hand side of the plate um, in the picture, the left-hand side in the picture. 
It uh, allows gram negatives but not gram positives, so you know you've selected for gram negatives. And it is also differential in, in that it, certain types of uh, organisms will have a different color appearance in EMB uh, as opposed to others. So that, you know there, there is a sort of a, what's called a uh, gasoline on water kind of iridescence. Uh, you know how gasoline, if you pour a little gasoline on water, you get this sort of rainbow film. That's called iridescence. And it, it is possible to have that with certain bacteria on, certain types of bacteria on an EMB plate, and that allows you to further identify. So it differentiates those from the others that are growing. So it is possible to have a selective medium or a differential medium or media that are both selective and differential. Okay, an enrichment medium, I talked to you about this before, it's when you try to enrich the media, you essentially what you do is you set it up, uh, you set up a, a culture medium which contains uh, a very small number or even one, only one source of a particular nutrient, uh, which uh, you're interested in bacteria that can use that uh, particular uh, nutrient source. Um, an example of that would be, uh, in this case, uh, phenol degrading. If you're looking for phenol degrading bacteria, there's very few bacteria that will break down phenol. Phenol is actually quite toxic for most uh, microorganisms. So if you have uh, an agar medium that contains phenol and you uh, put samples, uh, inoculate with samples that you take that contain thousands of different uh, species, you know, you take a soil sample, for example, it's going to have thousands and thousands of different species. Uh, anything that does grow will, uh, the fact that it's growing indicates that it's uh, taking its nutrients from the phenol and therefore it does have the ability to break down phenol. So that's an example of an enrichment medium. It doesn't have to be phenol. Phenol is the ex an example. Okay. For example, uh, another good example would be when they, they were interested to see if there were any, uh, if they could isolate microorganism bacteria that uh, could use oil uh, as a, uh, I'm talking about petroleum oil, uh, as a uh, source for uh, nutrition. So they, you know, prepared uh, agar that, uh, agar with um, uh, oil in it. And then they took samples and, uh, you know, if you're looking for something, then uh, uh, you're trying to, um, uh, you, the place, the best place to look for it is where it occurs in nature. So they took samples from uh, places where uh, oil naturally bubbled up to the surface, uh, for, you know, for thousands, tens of hundreds of thousands of years or they took a, a sample from around the soil of a, a petroleum oil pump that has been pumping for decades. And uh, they did actually manage to isolate bacteria that can use and break down uh, oil. And there's another example. All right, so we've gone through this before in the lab, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, but it is an extremely important point, and that is that you know you need often, you want to be able to get a pure culture that contains only one species or even one particular strain of a species of bacteria. And so you wanna grow individual colonies. A colony is a population of cells growing on the plate in a circular, isolated, single area. And, uh, it started as a single cell that grew and divided and doubled and uh, eventually overnight, after overnight culture, it becomes that individual single colony growing separate from others. So you know, because it's separate from the others, that it arose from a single cell plated at that spot. Often you might hear colony forming unit. Uh, colony is referred to as a colony forming unit, but for bacteria, typically you're going to so we're talking about colonies and because they're all derived from a single cell you can call them clones of each other and the method that is used in order to uh, do that is uh, the streak plate method now, i've gone through this before i'll go through it again you 
take a agar plate. Uh, this looks to me like a um, McConkie plate, uh, based on the fact that they're different colored colonies here, white and red, white and pink. But it doesn't matter what kind of a plate. This is just showing the streak plate method, uh, the method of inoculating the plate. You take the loop and you sterilize it by flaming it. In other words, you flame the loop so it's sterile. You take a sample from your bacterial, uh, you take a sample uh, using the, the, the sterilized loop and you streak it across, I'm gonna change colors here. You streak it across the surface gently of the agar. Streak it gently across the surface and Normally, you would have so many bacteria that they will grow uh, as uh, confluent uh, uh, bacterial cultures, and I'll uh, show that here after culturing. No, I'll get a better color. Here, this, yeah, the, hmm, kind of dark, huh? Let me see what I can, if this works. Doesn't matter, it's here. It's a confluent culture here. You see, they're they're all a, col, a confluent growth. They're all uh, uh, gr this is after overnight culture, so there are there were lots and lots of bacteria, so you don't see individual colonies. Um, once you streaked uh, the plate at uh, one here, then you again flame sterilize your loop. That's one. And this time again, you streak, and what you do as you're streaking is you cross the previous streaks at one. You can see the streaking pattern just by tilting the petri dish uh, to the right angle. You'll see the uh, streaking pattern, and you streak crossing a few of the lines. So as the loop crosses these lines that were um, that were inoculated earlier, it picks up some bacteria, but much fewer, and then smears them, streaks them across this area here at number two. The end result is that in that area, you will have uh, fewer colonies. And as the bacteria is streaked, more and more bacteria are laid onto the surface of the agar, so there are fewer. And now you start seeing a few individual separable col separate colonies. Uh, again, the uh, flame is loop. Uh, again, the loop is flamed uh, after you streak two. Immediately, you flame the loop and then uh, streak at three. And now there's very little picked up because you only streak across uh, this area here. And you picked up a few bacteria. And now, when you look at the plate after overnight culture, you get confluent growth at one, uh, somewhat confluent, starting to get uh, individual colonies at two. It may or may not work uh, that you get individual colonies here, but typically you would also have um, individual colonies at three. The fact that you have uh, colonies at three, individual isolated colonies at three, allows you to study these further in more detail by uh, using a sterile loop to pick, and it's called picking, pick a colony, just lift up one colony, take a sample from an individual colony and grow it on other types of plates or in other types of cultures uh, so that you can then identify what that particular one is. So you can see that this is a very useful method for getting uh, obtaining a pure uh, colony of one type of a pure culture of one type of bacterial col uh, bacterial strain or species now one thing in the lab is that we typically want to be able to preserve uh, cultures uh, that are grown that we have available different types of bacteria and this is typically done by freezing them and cells, including human mammalian cells, all kinds of mammalian cells, and even red cells, can be frozen in liquid nitrogen as long as the 
cells uh, have uh, had glycerol added to them before freezing. It's a little more complicated. I'm making, I'm simplifying it somewhat, but essentially it's addition of, uh, I think it, I used to use 10% to freeze cells, 10% glycerol to freeze cells. Another way of freezing cells, bacterial cells at least, not uh, eukaryotic cells, is to lyophilize, freeze dry them. They are frozen and dehydrated by putting them in cold temperature and low atmospheric pressure. So you take a flask and you take the uh, take the air out so it's uh, under a, at a very low pressure it's essentially a vacuum and water will boil off at, uh, uh, and disappear from the culture very quickly that's called freeze drying uh, if cells don't have water uh, they live typically for a long time particularly if a little bit of uh, protein usually yeah people add um, um, some kind of uh, source of protein to the cells to help with lyophilization stability. Um, the reason why freeze drying is uh, a good way to uh, preserve uh, bacterial cells is because uh, if you remove all the water, then uh, you prevent ice crystals from forming. Ice crystals have sharp points and pierce the plasma membrane and kill cells that way. All right, let's talk about uh, reproduction in bacterial. We're talking about microbial growth, so reproduction is important to know what happens. It's not by mitosis, as this happens in, pro in eukaryotic cells, but it occurs by binary fission. So prokaryotes, prokaryotes, like bacteria or archaea, will uh, grow and reproduce by binary fission, in which case the uh, DNA gets replicated. Remember these cells, here we see an example of a gram-positive organism. The cell uh, first replicates its single uh, circular uh, chromosome. So the DNA gets replicated and then the other components of the cell uh, increase in size, plasma membrane and cell wall begin to divide and they just split into two, two daughter cells. That's binary fission. When we consider uh, what is happening, excuse me, let me get rid of that. When we consider what is happening, you should understand that uh, there are certain terms that are used uh, associated with growth of cells. Generation time is the time needed to double. And I can tell you that uh, generation time in bacteria when conditions are just right is 20 minutes. They will double in numbers in 20 minutes. And that means that, uh, you know, if you, if you look at a table uh, every 20 minutes for over 24 hours, how many you get? You get millions from a single cell. You can imagine how quickly, when uh, someone has a bacterial infection, how quickly things are moving, advancing, and there are more and more bacterial cells in them. It's uh, serious, and it needs quick attention. And once uh, it's been identified and uh, understood or diagnosed that the person has a bacterial infection that is treatable, then they need to get their antibiotic right away. So, because if you wait another 20 minutes before you give it, it's twice as bad as it was before, potentially, right? So, generation time is incredibly fast for bacteria. It's the time needed to double in total number. Generation number is the number of actual doublings that have occurred. And you can see that, uh, actually, this is good. This, this uh, shows that after, uh, it, with, uh, generation number of 10, that means that they it's doubled 10 times. And if it's going every 20 minutes, uh, you know, when I, conditions are ideal, uh, that would be 200 minutes uh, because 10 times 20 minutes is uh, 200. 200 minutes is um, three hours and 20 minutes. So after three hours and 20 minutes, there are 1,024 more cells because one cell can divide into 1,024 cells. 
Now, nobody comes in with an infection because of one bacterial cell. They already have uh, probably hundreds of thousands, if not millions, I'm pretty sure millions. So you can imagine 1,024 times that. Another five, if you add another five times 20, another 100 minutes later, it's 32,000, okay? So things move incredibly fast in terms of the number of cells with each of the generations, you know? And these are the generation times, this is 20 generations. 20 generations is 20 times, if it's growing under ideal conditions, 20 minutes at each generation. 20 times 20 is 400. Uh, 400 minutes is um, uh, six hours and 40 minutes. In six hours and 40 minutes, you have a million times more. Things move fast. Generation time is uh, short in, in bacteria uh, that are rapidly dividing and the number of generations quickly uh, advances so you have many doublings and you have a lot more cells. Bacterial growth typically, and this <clears throat> applies to a lot of microorganisms, what you get when uh, uh, a culture or a person is, is inoculated or a person is infected, typically you get different phases. The first phase is called a lag phase, and there's very little growth of the bacteria. This is a logarithmic scale. Um, so each unit is 10 times more. So there's one here, and then this is uh, uh, 10 times more than the previous line I drew. This is another 10 times more. So this line here, right there, is 100 times the number of this because it's two units on this log scale. Okay. So 100 times another because this one is 10 times this. So if this is one, this would be 10, this would be 100, this would be 1,000, et cetera. That's a logarithmic type of scale, right? So nothing much happens in the uh, lag period. It's a lag phase of growth, bacterial growth curves. It's a lag phase, here's time, here's number along this scale, logarithmic number, and then uh, the uh, organisms that get accustomed to the medium and the growth and they start and the growth medium around the surroundings and they start to divide more rapidly and they go into a log growth phase or also called an exponential growth phase and growth is incredibly rapid and it can be as fast as uh, having a uh, generation time of every 20 minutes. So this would be uh, many generations. And then things slow down, and typically things will slow down. They'll go into a stationary phase, a typical stationary phase, because the because of something that's negatively impacting the growth of the bacteria. It could be that they're the bacteria have exhausted the nutrients available in the tube, if it's a broth culture, or on the plate itself if it's petri nutrient petri agar nutrient agar on petri dish so or they're just too crowded and they're starting to produce metabolic products that inhibit each other that is possible now i should tell you that that's the bad news uh, in terms of growth that it is very 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 fast very advanced can be advanced very quickly so the symptoms of that growth can also advance very quickly the good news, however, is that when bacteria start to die for whatever reason, it is also typically in a logarithmic kind of uh, death. So you can, in a culture, and let's look at a, let's think of, a, you know, this, make it as simple as possible. You have a large uh, flask with nutrient broth in it, uh, liquid broth. You inoculate it, it starts to go through a lag phase, nothing much is happening but then it goes into the log phase, from the lag phase to the log phase, and then it gets too crowded and nutrients are depleted, so it goes into a stationary phase. The cells aren't dying, 
but neither are they growing. But then they will go into the death phase. And when they do, they will die at an exponential rate. So it's very quick. That's good news because if the death, for example, of uh, bacteria in a person is due to uh, antibiotic, that means it'll start dying and they'll die in a logarithmic pattern, the decline in number logarithmically. Okay, so bacterial growth, these are things to consider both in vitro, in, in culture, in vitro means in culture, or in vivo, in, in a living organism like in a patient. We can directly measure microbial growth. We can actually uh, count the number of bacteria that are present in a culture. And it's done using the following four steps. First, diluting uh, from a sample. So these are dilutions. You take nine millimeters of broth, nutrient broth in each of these tubes. You put nine mil milliliters of sterile broth. And then you take your original sample in one millimeter. Did I say millimeter? Milliliter. And you put it in the nine and you mix it up so you have 10 mils. And then you take one mil off, so that's a one in 10 dilution from your original. And then you take off one ml and you put it into nine mls of broth and you mix that up. And so that's a one in a hundred dilution now and you go on and on like that because, and you quite often you have to do that several steps and sometimes even more than one, two, three, four, five dilutions here. You, sometimes you have to go even higher because you know, there's an awful lot of bacteria that could be in an original inoculum. So you can do all of these dilutions and get, uh, and get samples. And then you plate each of these samples. You take a small sample of it and put it on top of uh, some nutrient agar. You can uh, pour it or you can spread it. It doesn't matter. You inoculate Petri dishes from that original uh, series of tubes. Each Petri dish gets uh, a sample from each of the tubes that we just prepared on the previous slide. So you inoculate Petri dish plates, nutrient agar plates from the different serial dilutions. You take a sample, small sample, and put it on either by pouring it or you can, you spread on a small sample. It doesn't matter which of these two methods you use. They're essentially the exact same. Um, although in the lab you would use the spread plate method, it's, it's better. So you take a small sample, you put it on, you spread it around. You can see here using a bent glass rod, you spread it all over the surface and colonies will grow. If you're going with the one in 10 dilution, probably you're going to end up with confluent growth. But if you use the higher dilutions, then you'll be able to have separate colonies that you can count. And typically we count plates. We only count the plates that have, you know, 25 to 250. I was taught 30, but here they say 25. Okay, so 25 to 250 colonies on the service. You count those plates. Here's a plate uh, that has, um, uh, 32 colonies, all right? Uh, 32 colonies, the dilution was on one in 10,000. This is step four. Step three is incubation. So you incubated each of these. In this case, they're saying that they transferred one ml and I said 0.1, it doesn't matter, but you always have to take it into consideration how much you plated. Um, so here they plated 30, uh, each of the samples from each of these tubes and they got 32 colonies on the one in 10,000. Well, 32 times 10,000 means that in this original uh, one ml sample, the very first one ml sample, there were 320,000 per ml. Okay. Sometimes direct measurement of microbial growth is done by filtration. You, they take a fixed volume of fluid, and this is done for uh, 
when people examine water samples from the environment, like in a lake or in drinking water, they'll take a fixed volume and put it in a syringe, and the end of the syringe has a filter in it that can be removed. So they push that water out of the syringe through the filter, and the filter picks up any bacteria that are in it, and then the filter paper is laid down on an that's shown in this photograph. It's laid down on a uh, on a plate with a nutrient agar in it, and it'll it's absorbent filter paper. It'll absorb the nutrients, and colonies of bacteria will grow if you culture it overnight, and you can count the number of bacteria. This is done typically for water samples. Water <clears throat> they're constantly sampling our drinking water supply. The acceptable level of gram-negative bacteria in drinking water is zero. And the reason for that is that gram-negative bacteria typically, not, they're also present in other sources, but they are, a, they are present in high numbers in uh, feces. So if your water sample is contaminated, your water supply is contaminated in any way with fecal matter, uh, it will show gram-negative bacterial. And uh, if you know that the water has zero gram-negative bacteria, then you know that uh, it is, in fact, uh, sterile and safe to, to drink. I guess sterile is not the right word. It is safe to drink. It will have some, you know, bacteria in it because, after all, it's open. It's a still an op open to the environment system you know you turn the tap on the water comes out it still could get a bacterium here and there falling into it but uh, it's treated water and it's treated in such a way that uh, any gram negative organisms will be killed uh, direct counting is not done it's extremely rare that uh, they actually will look under a microscope and directly count the number of bacteria. Mm, I was going to say I've done it. I, I know. It's very rare. They're so small. They're difficult to see. They're typically, uh, they're moving or they're vibrating because they're so tiny. They're getting bombarded and vibrating. Very, very difficult to do. Yes, sometimes turbidity is used to estimate the number of bacteria. I've done that. Uh, I've used turbidity. It just means how milky or opaque the solution is. The light source shown here is a light bulb, but nobody uses light bulbs anymore. They use light emitting diodes. It gives you a very steady kind of light to measure. A light bulb will give you really a varying intensity. It's not steady at all. So they use light emitting diodes and they see how turbid the uh, sample is if it's very turbid it contains more this is more of a, a done in the lab after growing in uh, cultures in in, uh, in broth and that is now the next the last slide here brings us to the last slide so you can estimate bacterial numbers um, by direct methods or indirect methods an indirect method would be using uh, growing some bacteria and looking for metabolic activity. Can is a certain enzyme present that breaks down a substrate, or drying it and weighing and estimating indirect. You know, it's, these are estimates. They're not also they're not very commonly done. Okay, so that's uh, what I can tell you about microbial growth and characteristics of it and ways of measuring it. And that is the end of uh, lecture six, part two. That's the end of, of uh, micro, microbiology lecture six.